from the BBC World Service in association with ABC and Akashvani. This is Stumped. Hello and welcome to Stumped, your intercontinental hit of news features and debate from the quirky world of cricket. I'm Alison Mitchell and I'm in Southampton this week because I've been commentating on the latest round of the 100 ball competition here in England. Also, I've been getting fully immersed in the closing stages of the FIFA Women's World Cup. And of course, there is a new England-Australia rivalry that has developed and born out of the semi-final. You know, we're so used to seeing England and Australia go up against each other at high level in so many other sports. And gosh, we've had that, haven't we, with the Ashes and the Netball World Cup this summer in particular. There's a Rugby World Cup coming up too with the men. But yes, the Matildas, well, they are a rising force. I reckon in soccer, football, we're going to see many more contests between England and Australia on the field with the round ball as well. Jim, what do you reckon? It has been a sporting phenomenon in the last week for Australia to have got to that game against England and England were too good for them on the night. But I have never seen so many people involved in watching the game. They had big screens all over the country set up at various grounds. They had more people watching on television, uh, 7 million out of a population of 26 million watched the game against England. So this is the most extraordinary. If you just said 10 years ago, uh, the next big television sporting event is going to be a football match with women playing. What? What? Uh, anyway, it's been extraordinary. And, and, and a wonderful boost for all of us in rather wintry conditions as we think about um, some cricket that's coming up at, at some point in the future. But you can't find a word about cricket in the last week. It's been all... Matildas and uh, the Lionesses. Uh, so I'm Srinil Gupta for Akashwani in New Delhi, and I'm sitting here on the sideline uh, against, uh, or watching rather, the winner of what I'd call the Sashes, the Soccer Ashes, and the Sporting Losers, the Matildas. I watched that game, and I can tell you, we were riveted, absolutely riveted. There were some absolutely sensational goals, and I thought... Uh, the Matildas had a very, very good chance of coming back in, but their talismanic Sam Kerr didn't actually get over that particular line, but you could see why. They are one of the most loved teams in the world, certainly in Australia. But just to come back to the cricket, well, India lost a bilateral series against uh, the West Indies after 16 or 17 long years, and that is saying something. There is a bit of a kerfuffle in the press, in the media, about all this, but I think what India is really worried about now is that they don't seem to have a settled white ball team ready for the World Cup, which is two months away. And that, I think, is really putting a cat amongst the pigeons here. We've got uh, Bumrah returning after injury, going off to Ireland, uh, leading the team. And I guess this is going to be one seminal test for what that team is going to look like as and when October comes by. Yeah, they don't have long, Sunil, do they, to get ready for the World Cup? Great to have you with us on the show once again. We're going to start off this week by talking about a debut performance to savour because 27-year-old Australian with Italian heritage, Spencer Johnson, made his first appearance for the Oval Invincibles in the 100 here in the UK and he caused a social media meltdown. His figures were three wickets for just one run in the 20 deliveries that he bowled in a victory over Manchester Originals at the Oval. He bowled at serious pace, regularly over 90 miles per hour, troubling England's best white ball batters in the England captain Joss Butler and Phil Salt. And this all came after having been named in Australia's T20 squad for the very first time. Uh, a lot of people around the world seem to know very little about him. So we wanted to get him on the show. Spencer, welcome to Stumps. It's great to have you on. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. Thanks for having me on. We're really pleased to have a chat. Um, when you first caught the eye in the Big Bash League for Brisbane Heat um, last season in Australia, but... When people heard that you were making a 100 debut, I think a lot of people assumed you must be a sort of 20-year-old making a debut and starting out. And then when they learn you're 27, the, the same question pops up as did in Australia. Where have you been? What's the story? So tell us, you know, fill us in on your journey because it's been one of quite a few ups and downs, hasn't it? Yes, I guess, I guess it's been unique um, coming in now at 27 and sort of not being seen before um, is different. but. For me, it's yeah. I probably wouldn't change it. I, I had a bit of a tough time with injury at from 21 to early my early 20s. Um, 
just with a few stress fractures and um, just your standard bowling bowling injuries. But um, body's harder now, and to come out the other side, it's yeah, it's it's quite cool. Yeah, and you've been you've dominated at grade level, West Torrens, which is club my cousin plays for. So you wanted to give a big nod to that. Um, yep. How did South How did South Australia support you as well? Because I I read that you had to take another job at one point in order to sort of keep yourself going financially. You know, when doing all of that rehab, quite an unusual job as well. Yeah. Well, yeah, West Torrens they've been awesome for me. I've been there since I was a kid. I guess I don't even know. Well, my early memories there are very young. Um, so just yeah, playing club cricket for them. Um, we won a couple of premierships, worked my way back in. And, um, yeah, I did have to do a bit of odd odd work here and there, um, greenskeeping and mowing lawns and things like that. But um, I think that's made me who I am now. And um, I've sort of done done the work life and done the cricket life. And, um, yeah, now I'm here. Which golf club were you at with the greenskeeper? I was actually just doing the um, ovals. So I was curating... Um, so obviously Henley and there was a couple other great grounds that I was that I was looking after, but sitting on a roller for eight hours on a Friday and then trying to bowl on a Saturday wasn't all that fun, um, especially when it gets quite hot in Adelaide, as you'd know. Uh, so that was wearing quite thin, and um, yeah, it was was really looking forward to hopefully getting back in the cricket setup because it was a tough couple of years there. Um, but yeah, it's all, it's all worth it now. Yeah, and just before Jim comes in, what have the Australian selectors been saying to you so far? It's obviously named in the T20 squad. They've put out the initial squad for the World Cup, but do you get a sense at all that you know you could be an injury away from a late call up, even for India, perhaps? Well, hopefully, but um, hopefully not. I guess if hopefully all the, all the big quicks are fit. Um, but yeah, it's been quite crazy. The the first comms I had with with Bales was just before a one day final in Australia and. Um, I didn't actually have his number, and I let it let it ring through, and then I, I thought oh, I better ring it back, and it, yeah, it was Bales, <laughs> and he was he's picked me for we got picked for a uh, Aussie A series in New Zealand, um, and that was after I think I'd only played two first class games at that stage, and only a handful of one day, so um, things were happening quite quickly back then, even, um, and then yeah, obviously. Uh, most recently, the South African tour, um, and he just sort of, yeah, he's, he said we're, we're keen to have you around this summer. So uh, hopefully, keep bowling well, and um, who knows what could happen. Spencer, Jim Maxwell here in Sydney. Congratulations on your achievements so far this year, and we're talking about your debut in the hundred, but it was actually your uh, professional debut back in two thousand and seventeen when your major injury issues started, it's led to three years out of the game. Were the times when you thought uh, your career as a cricketer was over? Well, I think so. When when we went in for the first surgery, the the doctor didn't seem that confident. He, he said, if if we can get you back running, that's, that's a tick. Um, so he wasn't actually quite sure if I would ever run again. And then... After the second surgery, I think those chances got even slimmer. Um, so it was was quite daunting at the time, and um, not playing for for three years, you sort of get yeah, it's it's not easy. But um, I think the support I had in South Australia, um, sort of, they obviously wasn't playing, but I was still close and um, around around the around the scene. So um, just to yeah. I don't know. It's it's tough, but thinking about it now, it's it's just a memory. Well, you perhaps can think of uh, what's happening to you now in terms of Pat Cummins' early years, where he spent most of his time at uh, Western University in Sydney rather than playing cricket. So, has he given you any advice? No, not yet. I actually saw him at uh, Travis Head's wedding, and there was there was a couple of Aussie players at Hetty's wedding, and they sort of Starkey and. Um, the, the big quicks, Hazelwood and uh, <laughs> Pat were there and they sort of said, loving the journey you're on, um, keep going. So, yeah, that was quite cool. So how have you handled the sort of the mental side of all this being in, in limbo and now, of course, coming back as you have so impressively? 
Um, I don't know. I guess it's happening so fast that you can't really sit back and it's. Or I think back to that Big Bash game at my debut and um, the commentators are saying, "Where's he been?" And, and then you sort of a little blow up a little bit. Um, yeah, I guess it's it's happening too quick to to realise what's actually going on. I reckon um, for me. In my close circle, I think it's quite cool for my family to see and my partner to to see what's happening behind the scenes, and um, I think they're they're just ex- as excited as I am. To be honest, they they're absolutely loving it. Yeah, hi Spencer, this is Sunil Gupta, New Delhi, and I believe that you were representing Italy now. So what happened there? I mean, from Italy to back to Australia, very big jump indeed. Yes, well, that's. Very proud heritage there. My my nuno was from the north of Italy, so he migrated to Australia when he was about twenty. Um, but yeah, the passport I've I've had for probably over twelve months now, and it was something I was sort of looking towards when things weren't looking that good in Australia um, and even South Australia, to be honest. Um, and it was sort of a way in to to get my name out there and. I think a few performances for Italy would have sort of sparked a, I guess, a bit of bit of media or a bit a bit more attention. Um, so that that was a plan to to help Italy get to the World Cup. They just actually played in Scotland, um, and they they did well, but they didn't didn't quite qualify. Uh, so I was I was meant to play in that, but when the the Major League Cricket tournament came up, that was sort of a a too good of opportunity to to toss up the first Major League cricket tournament in America um, for the Knight Riders franchise, which was very cool to be a part of. Um, so unfortunately for Italy, we, we had to give that one a miss. Spencer, brilliant to have you on. Good luck for the rest of the 100 and everything that's coming after that with the, the Aussie T20s as well. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Now, just over a year ago, we were talking about Ben Stokes' decision to retire from one-day international cricket. But... Like Moeen Ali in the Ashes, he's back. The England men's test captain has said he's coming out of retirement to play in the World Cup in India in just a couple of months' time. Now, as recently as last month, Stokes reiterated that he remained retired from ODIs and he planned to use a six-month break from test cricket to sort out the long-term issue he's had with his left knee. I remember, he ended up playing as a batter only in the Ashes, really, because of it, and, and England did miss his bowling. Um, Jim, we, we all know how committed Ben Stokes is to his country as test captain. Um, were you surprised, though, by the news of the World Cup in any way? No, not at all. It, it was the greatest certainty since rain came down at Old Trafford, I reckon. Um, <laughs> so he was, he was always he's always going to be coming back if he was fit. Um, yeah, I, I don't think there's any doubt about it. He, he doesn't want to miss out particularly at the moment where he's, uh, his star has risen so strongly and um, just hope that, you know, his, his body can manage it. That's the, that's the question because he may only have another couple of years before something serious happens. But, yeah, no surprise. Yeah, I think that's been why there's been somewhat in some quarters a mixed reaction from England fans who kind of want to protect him for the test game and thought it was a great idea that he would have a break from cricket, sort out the knee and be, you know, fully fit and firing for for the India tour to come and, you know, further beyond as well. Um, But, you know, even as a batter at the World Cup, he's such a talismanic figure, isn't he? And you think of the experience, um, you know, that he's had in clutch World Cup moments that is irreplaceable. I mean, you think to the 2019 World Cup final in particular and the super over, um, getting England over the line then, um, the hand he played in the most recent T20 World Cup. But even, I suppose, that the experience he had of being hit for all those sixes by Carlos, Carlos Brathwaite in a losing T20 Cup final as well. And I suppose, Senor, the fact that um, he had asked Moeen to come out of retirement and Moeen had agreed, it would feel a little bit you know, tricky for him to say no when the same question was asked as him. Well, as long as Moeen didn't ask him, but yes. I yeah, it wasn't Mo, you. but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but funny enough, I was just thinking about those sixes that were hit by Carlos Brathwaite, and that was the Eden Gardens in Calcutta, or Kolkata. And so India will not have very happy memories for it. Maybe that's one thing he wants to redress, because I'm sure somewhere in the back of his mind, it's niggling. He's a proud man. You know, what I'm, I'm I, you know, I mean, Jim is absolutely right. He would never give up a chance like this, especially having won the previous World Cup. But... I think 
eventually you've got to think about the future as well. Now, you know, ODI games, white ball games are very stressful. I mean, they're strenuous. You've got to go for it every every moment of the game. And certainly in terms of his bowling, I mean, he hardly played in the IPL games. So I think he's got to think about it. And of course, England have got to treat him with kid gloves, or, you know, when he's playing for them, because if he's in the team, he's going to play. And I don't think he's going to be bowling, certainly not in the pitches here in India. So it's going to be purely as a batsman or a batter. And I think maybe that is the one thing that is the saving grace for him when he comes to India, because I think his, as you said, talismanic, um, you know, feel in the team, what he brings to the team and to other teams as well. They've seen what he's done, uh, you know, in, in basketball and in winning all those test matches. So I think that it's a psychological thing that is actually playing in his mind and playing the mind of the England team to have him uh, with them in the in the World Cup here in India. So, yes, as Jim said, it was absolutely a no-brainer if he was going to be invited. Maybe he'd invite himself, actually. I was thinking, he going to say, hello, mm-hmm. you know, here I am. I'm available if you want me. But, uh, oh, I'm looking forward to seeing him. I mean, certainly, if he mm-hmm. comes and he plays, I'm looking forward to seeing him. No question. Definitely. It was quite amusing that um, when the news broke and was officially confirmed, Stokes just tweeted, LOL, LOL. LOL. <laughs> which was the same response that Moeen gave him when he first said, World Cup, uh, sorry, mm. Ashes to Moeen. So, yeah, good from Stokes. Um, on the flip side, Jim, when you look at the squad that England have put out for their ODI series against um, New Zealand, which is the sort of precursor to their, their World Cup squad coming out, there is no Harry Brook, I guess, because of Ben Stokes coming in. And mm. that's you know a, a big name that a lot of England fans have latched onto, saying, well, how can you leave out Harry Brook? I mean, what would you have done in that circumstance? It's a problem. You mean they've got Liam Livingston and uh, David Milan scored four hundreds in the 36, uh, 50 over games that they've played since the last World Cup. They played 80 odd before 2019. So they haven't played as much of uh, that form of the game. And uh, he's only, I think, played three games. So uh, he's a bit stiff given what he's done. Um, mainly with the, the the red ball, quite obviously, and so brilliantly. But, um, yeah, I think it was, unfortunately for him, just a simple matter. Well, if Stokes is playing, there's no room for Harry uh, when they look at the balance of the team that uh, they had and has, and has performed. I mean, that's the thing with this squad. Um, they are the champs. So uh, maybe someone will get injured. Something normally happens along the line. But, uh, yeah, it, it does it does seem out of whack. But a player of his ability, and he's got a, a heap of ability, is not in the fold. But um, we'll see what happens between now and the World Cup. Well, that is it for this week's Stumped. I'll say thank you to Jim Maxwell and to Sunil Gupta. And, of course, to all of you for listening. Make sure you're with us again next week for a bit more. See you then. Bye-bye.